Assalamu alaikum Anas, how are you brother? Great, how are you doing Farhan? I'm doing great, Alhamdulillah. So tell us something about yourself, who you are, where are you right now and where are you from? Uh, I'll just start with the last one. Uh, I'm from Lagos, Nigeria. Um, I'm currently in Canada trying to, you know, get some kind of certification and begin the long journey, which you call life. Mm. And uh, I have a background in commerce, which is right. something that I like doing. I really don't like working. So that's, I think, my biggest pull to uh, commerce because I feel like they say fortune favors the bold. So, mm. you know, you have to start something and do your best and see where it goes. So that's my personal philosophy. So I have a background in commerce and I'm currently pursuing a certification in business admin just to mm. increase my organizational skills and business skills as well. Right. And, you know, have something going right here. So that's my background. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, there is a saying: the birds of the same feathers flock together. I'm also flock from together. the I'm also from the commerce background, by the way. I'm also an accounting uh, person. I, I was an accounting person. I don't I don't really do oh. that anymore, but I was doing that. All right. So tell me the certificate that you are doing here in Canada. Uh, it's a business admin certification, business administration. and it's a year long, so nothing too, you know, lengthy. I, I just want to develop some skills which I personally feel like. I might not have or might not be up to standard. So just to get that those skills going and see where that takes me down the road. Uh, the way you mentioned you want to brush up those skills, are these skills related to accounting or your personal development? No, no, personal development. So, uh, in, and that has to majorly with my background because like I said, I come from Nigeria and Nigeria is a place where there are there's absolutely no organization from mm. traffic to school to life itself there is absolutely no organization mm. so moving into the western world where everything has laws that you mm. know constrain everything like it, it's more of a different approach so mm. me coming here i figured that okay um in life you need some kind of organization and i come from a place that has zero to none Mm -hmm. So my best bet was, okay, I moved to this place, which is Canada. All right. I get to learn these skills and then use those skills to develop myself and develop others as well mm -hmm. down the road. So that's the main reason why I decided to make this big leap in life. All right. So, uh, I mean, what are the real name of those skills that you are looking to develop in yourself? We are going to talk about that as well. But first you tell me, what is your mother language? Uh, mother language is uh, definitely English because Nigeria is an English-speaking country, but I also right. speak Hausa too. Okay. So that's a West African language. It's, uh, they speak it in Nigeria, Northern Ghana, Togo, Mali, Niger, mm -hmm. even some parts of Saudi Arabia too. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very broad language, so right. many places across the continent. So mm -hmm. that's also my second language, I guess. Okay, so even in Nigeria, most of the people are speaking English, but when you were moving to a real-time English-speaking country just like Canada, so was IELTS yeah. required to move there, or was it not necessary? Yeah, definitely, it was. I had to take uh, the IELTS exam. There okay. are some countries that are exempted, but mm -hmm. even Nigeria is an English-speaking country. You mm -hmm. are required to have IELTS, but sometimes it also depends on the school. So my mm -hmm. school specifically demanded that I take the IELTS exam. So that was what I mm. had to do. All right. And in most of the countries, I have seen that IELTS band is not very high in number. If they want to move to other countries, for example, for Saudi Arabia, it's not a very huge band that you have to score if you want to move to uh, an English speaking country. How was in your case? In my I mean, case, how? it was uh, the school's um, band was uh, 6.5. But um, I had no idea because, like, I hadn't done, I hadn't taken IELTS before. So it was something new. So when I learned that, I had to hurry up to do it. So I just had two weeks of uh, time, like, to prepare myself for it. And mm -hmm. I had never seen, you know, like an IELTS example question mm -hmm. or anything like that. So mm -hmm. I had just two weeks to do everything. But Alhamdulillah, I got that through 7.5 and That's got crazy. through it. 
Yeah. That's great. That's yeah, great. That, that, that's my I hope story. Okay. So finally, after completing your, after getting the desired bands, more than desired bands and IELTS, you are now in Canada. So you tell me, what is the difference that you have found over here in Canada in the education system? I mean, how they were treating education system in Nigeria and how is it here in Canada? In Nigeria, the educational system is all about, we have students, they pay their fees. Mm -hmm. Now we're just going to teach them. If they understand it, that's fine. If they don't understand it, that's fine. And then mm -hmm. we just move along to the next set of students the following year. And if you don't make it, you just have to repeat. So there's not much focus on students, especially on the individual level, because here in Canada, the main difference is that a teacher always follows up. They always make sure that you understand the fact that you can always ask questions. And if mm. you're, you know, drawing behind in class, you can always come to them and they'll be more than willing to help. They really like it when you approach them mm. with questions and all. But in Nigeria, that's not really the case. And I can't, I don't want to say all teachers do that because there, there are some very nice teachers Except in Nigeria who do you. the same. Hmm. Yeah, but speaking generally, broadly, uh, teachers in Nigeria just teach because they have to. Hmm. That's their job. They, they, they don't, there's not much passion for it. It's just a job. Okay. So I would say that's the biggest difference between the, Nigerian educational system and the Canadian educational system. All right, Anas, just as you have mentioned that in Nigeria, if you do not understand anything, either you, if you pass your exam, somehow you move on to the next class or you have to repeat your class. So what's the yeah. situation over there in Canada? Well, in Canada here, if you fail a course, you have to wait and take it again. But okay. I, I, I don't wanna say it's very common and I also don't want to say it's not common, but some people do have to repeat courses here and there. But generally speaking, if you do your assignments well, you take your tests seriously and your exams and you, you know, follow up in class properly and you read, the chances mm -hmm. of that happening become very, very, very slim because, you know, here everything is streamlined. So, you know what you're going to be doing when you're going to be doing it. So it makes everything much easier for you. All right. So just as you were saying that teachers in Nigeria are not very passionate about the profession, they are more considering it as a job. How exactly yeah. it is in Canada? That's the first part of the question. Secondly, you also have to tell me, like in Pakistan, it happens. In school system, to be specific, there is no specific criteria of hiring a teacher that becomes a reason for not having the passionate teachers or a, or a person who is capable of becoming a teacher, a nation builder. So what's the criteria over there in Nigeria and in Canada? Honestly, the criteria for hiring teachers in Nigeria, because I've been a around when like my school, then when I was in school in Nigeria, I, I've seen where lecturers and teachers would be hired like in my presence. And all they had to do was complete uh, particular test, you know, on the subject that they would like to teach or mm. the program that they would like to teach. So if you're a math teacher, they would hand you a paper filled with math questions and you just mm. had to solve it. And, you know, after that, you just talk to whoever is in charge. And when they feel like you're able to speak or communicate efficiently or just well, Mm. That's it. You get hired. There, there is no background check. There's no, mm. you know, deep, uh, what's it called, observations into your experiences and all. Like, it's just, you can do it. Fine. Here you go. That's the job. But mm. here in Canada, you find out that there's background checks. Teachers have to go through an entire criminal check. They have mm. to do this. They have to do that. There's just so many checks and balances here that it's hard for a teacher to not you know, be passionate about the job mm. that you get in because the stress alone to become a teacher, it's not something you would go through if you didn't have the passion. Mm -hmm. And in Pakistan, it's the same situation, by the way. The way you were saying that in Canada or in developed countries, the, the way they check the criminal background of the teacher, so they want to see that morally, is this person capable of becoming a teacher or not? So based on that, I mean, in Pakistan, you know, 
teaching profession is not a very a model profession that you can consider that everybody wants to join it's just an last option if we are not getting job anywhere so we'll go for the teaching field this is a very common scenario in pakistan how it goes in nigeria and canada yeah that's honestly the same like the the whole unemployment thing around the world the situation when it comes to unemployment has forced in especially in developing countries like nigeria and pakistan it has forced so many graduates Hmm. to just search for jobs that on a normal day they would not have considered because there are just no jobs so it's kind of like what comes your way is what you just take which goes back to the point we made earlier about them not having the passion for it it's because it's more of a last resort job to them hmm. so hmm. that passion is in there they they're just doing it because that's what came their way there mm. there there aren't jobs that you can go through because when you study engineering in the university mm. and after spending 4 5 6 years in in the university and you get your engineering degree and then you get out and you're looking for jobs and there are no jobs for about 2 years mm. and then all of a sudden a secondary school puts up a sign saying they need a physics teacher and mm. you know you, you seem to know physics then that's it you just have to take it because you've been, you haven't had a job for 2 years since you graduated mm. so that passion is in there you're doing it cuz that's all you got hmm so true and secondly this is also a very common scenario that people are completing their degrees and they are not getting proper jobs in the market what do you think who is responsible for that is it only because there are not much jobs available in the market or is it also because the student who has completed his degrees he is not capable of finding out a job or might be there are no proper career counseling training skills provided to the students i mean just as we were talking like now they are not trained how to apply for a job they are not trained i mean students specifically in pakistan they are not trained how to write a resume even what exactly they have to talk in an interview how they can talk about the promotion how they can talk about the increment they are not trained for these things they are not trained for careers at all they are just filled with the input of information we are just filling out the information with into them into the student they don't know where exactly they have to prove the output what would be the source of output how do you see that in your country Well, when it comes to students graduating and not getting jobs after, I would say mostly that uh that's mostly a government problem because you know, when there's development in a country, mm-hmm. the government is doing well, you know, the economy is strong, that leads to businesses opening. And businesses opening leads to vacancies, and vacancies lead to you know people get in those vacancies which means jobs right mm-hmm. so when the government does not function as it should those businesses that were supposed to have opened up seem to close or not even open up at all mm-hmm. so that leads to a downward spiral when it comes to employment it's not really the problem or the fault of students because you can attend six years you know at a university trying to get a degree and you get the degree even if it's you know um i don't know the particular grading system that you guys use in pakistan but in nigeria uh, there's first class second class and third class so third class would be the low guys and second class upper would be the second class lower second class upper and mm-hmm. then there's first class so for those most people most average university students always end up in the second class upper or second class lower and okay. then the very smart students end up in the first class then mm-hmm. the guys who just came through university end up in you know the third class mm-hmm. so those in the uh, second class upper who were supposed to get just jobs good jobs not the best jobs mm-hmm. that's for like first class students but second class upper and lower get nice jobs at least right mm-hmm. So when you have second class uh, upper students who do not uh, have jobs and they graduate with those degrees mm-hmm. you know that's a nice degree it's not it's not bad it's not third class it's second class upper right mm-hmm. when they graduate 
and they're looking for jobs and you know they've attended all the seminars they want to attend they've attended all the lectures all the counseling on how to apply for jobs how to get jobs at the end of the day if there are no jobs they might have all of that knowledge but there's no way to put it there's mm-hmm. no one to test them on all of that all mm-hmm. they can do is just sit and wait or keep trying those mm-hmm. are the two options but when you have a functioning government a good economy that keeps churning out businesses because when the economy is good right people mm-hmm. tend to want to open businesses it could be a barber shop it doesn't have to mm-hmm. be a multi million dollar yeah. business True. you can open up a restaurant employ waiters employ cashiers employ chefs employ you know the project managers behind do there are so many options right so when businesses like that keep opening employing 30 40 50 people at a time the economy seems to rise and that also gives rise to people being employed mm. so even if you don't graduate with the best grade at least you know that there is a job somewhere in that little line that you can fit in it doesn't have to be at the top but you can mm. fit in somewhere at the middle mm. so it all goes back to the government when it comes to jobs mm-hmm. so just as you are saying it all goes to the government it's the government responsibility but what do you think about the education system are they training are they training providing them training about the jobs or the business the way you mention it could be any business it doesn't need to be a multi millionaire businesses it could be a barber shop it could be a small restaurant on the road side might be but for that thing is it really allowed i mean i also want you to do a business at a very low scale but my family said you have done your mba you are studying a lot and after that you are going to start this tiny business we are not allowed to do this at all who do you think is responsible for that because i i take it like education system even you if you if you know if you are from the business administration background you have to tell me how it goes in canada specifically but in pakistan how it goes even if you are doing mba business administration it's all about the job thing we are not trained we are not tuned in a way that after getting education we have to start a business it's all about starting a new job it's all about finding a job it's all about if you will get the skill you can be able to work in a in a big company it's also about working yeah. in that business skills are not there what do you think how can we develop this thing i mean even if after studying business people are looking for jobs and people who are doing business most of the time in pakistan to be specific they are not educated and educated yeah, people that, go to them yeah yeah for me i believe that also goes back to the whole counseling from a very young stage from mm-hmm. a young you know level because when you have someone who his entire life all he or she has dreamed about is oh yeah i need to get to this level i need to graduate i need to get this degree mm-hmm. because when you get a degree the next thing is to get a job everyone's mind that that's everyone's mindset or almost everyone's mindset right mm-hmm. you, you go to school because you need to graduate because mm-hmm. you need to get a job so you can have a life right mm-hmm. but people aren't really told from childhood that okay you see in life you can get a degree get a job and still be a business owner right mm-hmm. you don't have to always just sit at a desk mm-hmm. from 9 a.m to 5 p.m. and just keep you know typing or signing documents or writing mm. this or that right mm. and that's the mindset that i believe like i like we mentioned at the beginning you mm. know people are slowly starting to realize because like i said earlier on to fortune favors the bold like if you take that leap and you decide okay this is what i want to do i'm going to be a risk taker mm. the rewards can be great at the end of the day mm. so people need personally i feel like people need to change their mindset to take mm. some risk right you don't always have to sit at a desk all day long and you don't always have to wait for you know someone to hand you a job offer before you can do something it's fine if you're just graduating or something like that and you don't have the financial means to open up a huge business or anything like that that's also fine you can go that route too 
But either way, I, I believe it works. But people should just keep at the back of their mind the fact that they can be business owners with their, you know, MBAs or bachelors in business administration. All right. So just as you were saying that they should be trained, that they can take risk and there is no harm in taking risk. But uh, how I take it, I mean, people are not trained to uh, how they can learn, how they can deal with the stress, with the pressure, because when they take a risk, there comes a pressure, pressure management, yeah. stress management. These skills are not there. And financial management is not there in, in our education system. They don't tell us how to deal with the finances, how to make money, how to make more money. They don't tell us. But anyways, and now you tell me that in Canada, I believe so. This is going to be very, this is already a very common thing that every student over there they are when they are student, they are with the independent mindset. I don't see that thing in Pakistan because in Pakistan, they take it like once we will complete the degrees, once we'll complete the MBA, after that, we are going to do some job or the business or any part time thing or whatever we'll be doing. We'll start looking for the job after completing MBA, after completing degrees. But in Canada and developed countries, we have seen that while they are the student, they start working in any organization. The way you said it could be anything. It's not about joining the big organization while you are a student. It's about doing or taking a start from anywhere, but at least becoming dependent. How it goes in Nigeria and what's your point of view about that? Nigeria is a very dependent country, in my opinion, because like I said uh, a while back, even as a graduate, you still have to wait for your parents to you know, put food on the table for you. Mm. And you're not expected to achieve anything until so you're about 27 uh, you know 28 ish so that's the long wait and that, that develops a dependent mindset in many people because and it's also not good to pressure people into thinking that they have to succeed at 15 or 20 years old it's fine whenever your development comes right but i believe that when it comes to dependence that's something that should be taught also at you know a tender age there are so many things that need to be included you know in the school's curricular system you know at a very young you know tender level and mm -hmm. for me I, I believe that and this is just my personal opinion and i don't know if anyone else might disagree with this but one of the biggest problems with not just pakistan or nigeria's educational system but the global you know educational system is that we feel and believe that, you know, knowledge is static. It's not dynamic. And that's, mm. that's one of the biggest mistakes, mm. right? Because knowledge and education are two evolving. different things, to mm. be honest. Mm. Yeah, they keep evolving and they're dynamic. They're, they're mm. not static. Mm. And if you've seen or if you've checked the educational system in the last 30 years, They've just included some new developments here and there, but it's still the same core things, right? There, not much has changed at the, at the center. Mm -hmm. They've just added, oh, yeah, there's a new discovery here, there's a new discovery there, and they just add that to, you know, the science topics and all. But mm -hmm. at the very core, it's all just the same thing. And it's been the same for the past, I would say, two, three hundred years. Because mm. Oxford and, and the rest of them, you know, they've been involved since that time. And till this day, they still continue with those same kind of cur curricula, um, you know, activities. Mm. So I believe that knowledge is something that is dynamic and the world's educational system should follow up with that kind of dynamic spirit. And, mm. you know, include things that aren't just from the past but they should try to include things that are, you know, present and also more geared towards the future, future mm -hmm. development. That's what I believe the world should be doing. Mm -hmm. We've left the past. I'm someone who really likes history, but mm -hmm. I believe that when it comes to education, the future matters, not the past. Yeah, you yeah. learn about the past, but mm -hmm. it should be about, you know, saving, building and developing the future of the world and of humanity as well. Mm -hmm. True. And this is also true that education system is dependent on past right now. They are teaching what happened in the past, all the case studies are there. And even, the, even if you talk about the computer, I used to teach computer subject once. And over there in 2020, I was teaching 
features of Windows 98, features of MSXO. Mm. This is true at graduation level. It's all about the past. I also take it like we are just telling them, we are just teaching them what happened in the past and we are not giving them exposure. We are not giving them a vision. We are not giving them brainstorming activities, critical, creative thinking activities. What can you create from this thing? I mean, there should be some activities like that. Isn't yeah, it? definitely. Definitely. For me, I believe that when it comes to teaching people about the past, the mistake is that they just lay it all out for them. They just mm. teach them, oh, yeah. This happened in, you know, so and so. This happened in 1960. This happened in the 1800s. Mm. But they they need to attach. What the mistake they make is that they don't attach lessons to those instances, right? Because when I come to you and I say, "Oh yeah, in uh, 1900, uh, India became a nation or something like that," like mm. if I tell that to you, like you're just going to say, okay. Mm. And, but what you need to say is that, okay, in 1900, this happened and this, 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 and this are the results, right? You need to teach them the moral of that lesson. Mm. And that's why many people don't like history too, because, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, they, they just see it as, you know, long pages of boring things yeah. that have happened and before. What they but, do have but, to do with that. Hmm. Yeah, they don't teach them the morals of that story it's because of this and this and this, that today we have this, this and this, or we have that, that and that. And that's the mistake that most of them make. And I believe that, um, like I said, the world is slowly crawling towards that kind of development and all, which is something good. And it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in one generation. It might take, you know, the, the next generation that's currently coming up to realize that, okay, education is very dynamic and you just have to learn what you, you know, what you're going to really make use of. And I believe, you know, the next generation will do better than this one in terms of education, though. Yeah. In terms of education. In short, they would. But now, uh, how I understand is that what you are saying, we are teaching the past thing, but we have to connect it to the present. We have to connect it to the past. That connection is missing, which yeah. is also a reason students are also losing interest in history. They are losing interest in the education as well. They're lo losing interest in the studies. So if we have to push them more so that we have to make them realize that what is the real importance of this education. Okay, now, you are right now in a developed education system. What do you think, what changes we need in developing education system? For instance, Canada, if we compare it with Pakistan and Nigeria, so what changes we should bring in our education system? And number two, who is responsible for that? Who can bring those changes? Is it the teacher, organizational institutions, or the government? Uh, it's Honestly, all hands on deck. None can function without the other. The government can make policies all day long and the teachers can ignore those policies mm. all day long. And the teachers can teach things all day long and the government can just come around and stop them from doing those things and, you know, find them or jail them. So it's supposed to be uh, uh, a concordia between the government, the teachers, even the parents and students because... Like I said, it's all hands on deck when it comes to what you want your child to learn in school. You don't just hand your child over and say, teach them whatever you want. The government and the teachers need to sit down together mm. and streamline, you know, the educational system. They should let go of most of the unnecessary things because, you know, in my time in high school, they taught us quadratic equation. And to this day, I haven't used it. It's just there. <laughs> And there are so many things like that. And I understand that it's meant to develop your arithmetic skills, but still, like, there's so much of it that's not really necessary. Mm. It's good, but most of it is not needed. It should be toned down. And so many things that people actually use day to day, their daily life should be introduced into educational systems as well. Government and teachers work hand in hand and they can all work without each other when it comes to education. Yeah, I got your point that they are most of the time keeping us busy. 
by doing some stuff by studying anything something which is might not be needed in the life which is might not be needed in the career and the way you are saying that government and teacher should sit together which means government should pay most of the attention toward the education side because this is also the funnel through which every single person of the nation has to pass through but now in your opinion what do you think because you have seen the two education system developing and the developed one in your opinion what do you think what are those key factors that we need to develop in the education system like nigeria and in pakistan um which are there in canada but not in our education systems uh, i would definitely say moving into the world of technology that's something that should definitely be included because mm-hmm. there is almost an absence of that in Africa as a whole and probably even Pakistan too but in the school that I went to uh, you know they introduced all of that and some schools are now introducing you know computers in there they teach computer studies that's mm. what it's called but sometimes they just have a few monitors that most of the students don't even all use like they just tell them okay sit here press this this and this and then mm. you know just to see it or something and mm. that doesn't it's not enough in today's mm. world right mm. everything is all about technology today and even more so moving forward into the future it's always going to be about technology now mm. and so the past is now the past when it comes to education and most of the world still clings on to that past they want to teach you quadratic equations but mm. they don't want to teach you how to use a computer how to you know use this software or that application and like i said i'm glad that uh, the world is finally realizing even africa is finally realizing that you know we need to teach our students more of our um, technology and coding and i've seen you know se- uh, students being taken to seminars now where they learn how to code how to you know make software and applications and all mm. so that's a welcome development from you know that part of the world so that's one of the things that i believe that is different when it comes to you know the educational systems in canada and nigeria but you know the developing side is slowly trying to catch up to the developed mm. all right so it is that field on which we should be working more and how about the personal skills I mean, in Canada, do they provide you some sort of extra trainings, knowledge, awareness trainings, which they were not providing in Nigeria? Did you feel any difference like that? Personal development, uh, career skills development, and all. Yeah, definitely, they definitely do that. That's one of the first things you do when you join school here. They they teach you all of these things, but more so, you get to actually learn and practice them as you go along, because right now. Um, personally like i've been you know working towards because for a long time i've been saying okay yeah i need this kind of organizational skill and i'm finally getting it and i'm getting it not in a way that you know i've just been told that okay you have to do this this and this to get you know your organizational skills a bit up but every day they tell you okay here are tasks here are things that you have to do so you now have to sit by yourself to plan those things out and they've already given you the information before you started school so now that you've been given those tasks you now have to sit down by yourself to judge okay where should i put this task where should i put that one mm-hmm. and then that's more of a practice for you and before you know it, you do that every day you do that weekly monthly yearly before you know it it's a, it's already a part of you and you mm-hmm. can't leave that and even when you're retired or something that stays with you because you've been doing it for so many years before So that's the practical aspect I believe that is lagging in, you know, the developing countries as opposed to Canada. Mm. And how can we develop the growth mindset as well, the productive mindset? Because how I take it in developing countries people are more into engaging themselves anywhere, somewhere, not in the productive activities most of the time. how do you see it happens in in developing con- in developed countries and how can we develop the growth mindset well um here most schools uh host seminars even now with the whole pandemic they still host mm. seminars and webinars as well mm. where as a student you can just you know casually come in 
and you know watch the whole thing or attend participate with them and they just mm. talk about different ideas you know at the end of the webinar you find out that you leave with so much information that you get to use the next day at school right so that's something that i believe is very important and in places like you know the developing countries they don't do that and even if they do they do it probably like once in 6 months once in 2 4 months but here they make sure they do it like twice a week so you can always attend get mm. new knowledge get this get that you're always engaged and then you get to use it the next day and the next day but mm. in africa or, or or in pakistan you you do that once every few months and then yeah. you know at the end of the day you find out that by the time you attend the next one you've forgotten what you learned in the last one mm-hmm. and it's just kind of like uh, i just have to attend it because i have to attend it and they make it kind of compulsory i don't know if they do in pakistan but in nigeria they make you attend it so even with that force that you must attend this you know mm-hmm. seminar you've already made you know that passion leave because i don't know about you but for me and most people when you force someone to do something they don't do it with as much zeal as they would yeah. if they did it by themselves by really them too intuition yeah. matters a lot hmm. yeah exactly all right my last question and coming back to the same from where we started what are those skills which you were looking to develop in yourself by coming to a developed countries and secondly what are the skills that every degree holder should have before jumping to the career uh personally the main skill which i had always wanted to develop and which i am working towards and i know even after many years i will still continue trying to work on it mm-hmm. is the organizational skill because like i said i come from a place that has almost no organizational skill like you drive out and traffic comes this way and then goes this way mm. and then everyone is just going everywhere so there is absolutely no organization and i figured that the rest of the world is organized and i come from a place that is not organized mm. and i know that okay i do not want to live in this kind of disorganization for the rest of my mm. life so i figured all right i might just move over to a place that has some kind of organization learn that organization and if i want i can then go back to the this organization i came from and try mm-hmm. to organize it and teach people to you know mm-hmm. organize themselves organize their communities and then, you know before you know it it's nationwide and it's now you know the whole continent that's trying to look organized or behave mm-hmm. organized so organization is definitely something that you know moves me like i want that organizational skill and then besides that i would say you know motivation you know learning to do things without you know anyone pushing you to do it mm. like here that's something that is all that that also stands out no one tells you what to do you just have to think that okay i need to do this at this mm. time and i need to get this done by you know this time so it's something that in nigeria you don't really have because Nigeria you know that no matter how bad things get you always find a way mm. but here there is no way there is only one way which is to get it done so mm. that's something that is also something that I am trying to learn and something mm. that mashallah I have slowly been learning to alhamdulillah alhamdulillah so just as you have mentioned that you are going to bring change into your own area from where you belong to what are those key or the top factors that you will start working on when you'll go back there uh definitely trying to make certain that people understand where they are coming from and the fact that where they come from is not in any way you know at the same level with the rest of the world they should try mm-hmm. to up their standards basically mm-hmm. you know be become role models for the rest of the continent mm-hmm. uh nigeria they call nigeria the uh, the giant of africa but in nigeria itself it, it's not we know ourselves that in the country <laughs> we're mm. just little people you know mm. there, there's not much giant about africa i mean nigeria it used to be but not anymore so that's something that um i definitely would like to see people realize and change so yeah that's definitely one factor 
Well, that's a wonderful vision you have, and I wish that Allah might give you success into that, which is really a yeah, hard yeah. track, a very hard track really to do. Really hard, yeah, one. because it's not like I mean, people who get some awareness, it's so difficult for them to give awareness to the other people as well. And I really wish that yeah. you become successful into that thing, and we all should be able to bring some changes. into the society into the people mindset so that we should grow as a nation not as an individual so anas thank um, you so very much for your time it was lovely listening to you and I, yeah and we also explored so many point i hope so that uh, the, the viewers will also get benefit from this video so thank you so very yeah, much for your time anas thank you thank Anytime, you thank you bro thank you stay safe and uh, keep changing pakistan as well yeah we are trying our thank best so. to <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, Take care. Hopefully. Bye. Okay. Take care. Bye. Allah is